But anyhow, we're here to talk about beeswax. I look at it from where we start in the hive through the process into turning it into something usable in the way of a candle that we can put up for sale. Nature's best, pure beeswax. Uh, surprising, you know, we do a lot of fairs and festivals. You know, people will come up by the table and beeswax. Wow, we haven't seen anything made out of beeswax for a long time. And uh, when, when people are talking, you know, they're, they're listening to what you're saying about the beeswax where, you know, it is pure. Some people are really glad to be able to buy something that doesn't have some kind of a scent in it. You know, it's like, you know, well, what does it smell like? Well, when beeswax burns, it basically just gives off a, a pleasant aroma, and it's clean. Uh, people that burn the, every other candles that are out there, they wonder why their windows have a film on them, and there's, you know, they've had cleaning companies and come in and say, well, I can't get this film off, and, and that's the first question the cleaning companies ask them, well, what do you burn? It's like, well, we burn this candle and that candle, and they said, that's, that's what's putting your, the film on everything in your house. Where does it come from? Of course, from honeybees. The wax production is basically by worker bees. They have four pairs of wax glands in their abdomen. When they produce wax, they're resting quietly. The, the term is festooning. The, the bees that are, are making wax, they, they have eaten the carbohydrates. They've eaten some honey that they've had stored or some nectar that they've had stored. And those carbohydrates are then turned into basically the wax in their body. So they, they convert the sugar from those carbohydrates into beeswax. They need that, you know, that sugar content of the honey is what they need. Uh, pollen, it does nothing for wax production. And bees must be of the right age for wax production. As the bee progresses through age, when the bee emerges, she is a, a house bee, a nurse bee, for basically the first couple weeks of her life. And then the next... 10 days or so, she produces wax, becomes a wax producing bee. Their brood food glands dry up and they start producing wax. The wax glands, it's uh, in their abdomen and it secretes a liquid which there's little porous glands under their, in their abdomen and they, they produce this wax gland in their areas, called, they call them mirrors. Uh, it then, as it comes out, it hardens into the, the small little crystal clear flakes that, that you might see. A lot of times, if you get a package of bees, uh, there will be these little wax particles on the bottom of your cage, or if you leave the cage set here on the table, the bees that come alongside the edge of the cage, those little wax particles are knocked off, and you'll have little waxy plates on your, on your table. Uh, so it hardens into those small little plates. They then transfer that from their abdomen. They, they grab a hold of that with their bristles on their, on their legs, bring it out to their mouth. She manipulates it a little bit, might add a little bit of saliva to it, and then starts forming the honeycomb that they need to form or the outer capping of a, a cell that they're going to cap, especially on honey, uh, that is a little bit porous. The comb and the wax, you know, everything is constructed from that. This is the wax scales on the underside of the bee. Uh, there's a bee turned upside down with, with the uh, four pairs of glands secreting the wax. Is, uh, they are resting. The wax just kind of oozes out of, out of those, those glands. They're just a... You know, you can almost see it's like layers, you know, under the, under the microscope where, uh, you know, you can see the little, little layers on there as it is formed and basically oozes out and then hardens as it comes, comes out, of the, uh, out of the gland in the abdomen. The new wax, again, when it's, it's produced is, is, again, almost pure white. You know, when, when we have a package cage or a, a piece of burr comb or something like that that they've made in, in the hive, you know, it, it is just about pure white. And as, as they walk over it and, and everything like that, it takes on the, the lemony color, so to speak, due to pollen and propolis and, and other stuff in the hive that is just added to that wax through the travel of the bees over top of it. 
It's an organic compound. There's 300 or so individual components that could be in that, in that wax. When we look at our industry, it's like, okay, why doesn't the industry produce pure beeswax? The bees do it, and to make beeswax by industry, it would cost a small fortune. You know, so they've just never done it. They make everything else that can come up with that might be close to beeswax, but it's not. Again, new, new white wax that the bees have made. Uh, these are some pictures from, from Dr. Larry Connor. These are the bees festooning, just resting you know, in, a, in a bunch somewhere, somewhere in the hive. They're just taking a break, resting. In most cases, it's, it's toward the outer edges of the, of the hive. That's kind of where they go and hang out and just rest a little bit. The bees that are in the center taking care of the brood, they're always busy, active. The nurse bees are feeding. So they're not, doing, they're not taking a break in there, but you move out a little ways away from, from the brood portion of the colony, and the bees are taking a rest. They may be hanging down along the bottom of the, bottom of the hive. They're just resting, and that's, that's the stage where they're producing the wax. And they fill it up and just add, you know, that you can see the, the bee manipulating the wax here with, the, with her mandibles and just forming that beautiful honeycomb that they, that they do so well. And they form, you know, they start out with the comb as they're capping. They basically just make a circle around it until it's completely sealed over. Just a couple neat pictures that, uh, that Dr. Connor had. Again, they're just busy forming that wax and, and lengthening it out. This is what we want to see, nice, pure, capped honey. And they're working on this. This will be probably finished up in a day. They'll have everything ready, and we'll be able to take that off. That's where we're going to get our nicest beeswax is from our, from our wax cappings. We have a couple little technical facts. You know, people say, well, you know, if, how can you have these things sitting out in the sun, you know, when we're at a festival or something like that? It's hot. You know, it's like, well, those are going to melt. No, as long as, as long as there's some air moving, even they can be setting directly in the sun, they may get a little soft sometimes, but they really won't melt. But if you have it in a plastic bag and there's sun hitting on this, then this is going to turn a real light color in here and it is going to start to melt because this is just like putting it in the window of your car. You have the sun beating down on it and the plastic will enhance the sun's rays and really jack up the temperature inside the bag. Wax melts at 147.9 degrees. It gets solid again when that temperature just drops down to 146.3. Its density is 0.963 which is less dense than water. Water has a 1.0 density, so it's a lighter density than water, so it will float on water because it's actually lighter than the water is. When making candles or other items from the wax, beeswax exhibits very little shrinkage when you get close to the right temperatures. Uh, it has basically 10% shrinkage from 200 degrees down to 77 degrees, that's important to know that it is going to shrink. So when we put wax in a mold, depending on the size of the mold, uh, how big it is, how tall it is, that shrinkage is very evident, especially if you're making a tall candle versus something short and squatty. If you're making a tall candle and you're looking at 10% shrinkage, well, if the candle is 10 inches tall and you don't add any extra wax, that, can, that mold, candle and wax in that mold is going to shrink roughly an inch. So again, that, that's going to depend on, on what temperature you're actually melting your wax at, what temp temperature you're holding it at as you're, as you're making a candle. So as you're making any kind of wax product, you basically need to top it off as it, is, as it starts to cool. You don't, want to make, you don't want to let it cool completely, otherwise you'll have a big line in there when you, when you pour your candle. 
So as it starts to cool, you have to be there. You just can't pour it and say, oh, I'm going to go read the newspaper for a while or, or watch, watch the next movie on TV because when you come back, you're going to have a candle that has shrunk down and now it's not the full size. It doesn't look like you wanted it to look. So that's one of the things that, that you have to watch out for when we're using the wax. Uh, you might see bloom on wax. People that make pure beeswax candles, they get like what we would call, you know, like when, when copper tarnishes or silver tarnishes, the air reacts with, with those metals. Well, the air reacts with, with beeswax also, and it will put a coating on it, which we call bloom. And some of you that were in here earlier saw me shining this up a little bit. Well, it has some bloom on the bottom still, but the top you can shine it up and, and it's gone. Same thing with this pretty dark piece here. You, know, you can shine that up and uh, the bloom goes away and you see that really ugly black wax under there. So it's uh, something that it doesn't hurt, doesn't hurt the candle, make it go away, rub it. If it's something that is smooth or has some really intricate edges around it, you can take a hair dryer and give it a couple shots, not right up close, just give it a little bit and the bloom goes away. Uh, the other thing that you can do to eliminate bloom is there's some sprays out there, uh, they call them candle luster, that you can spray a light coating of that on there and it basically seals the wax and uh, keeps it from blooming Wax sources. All our wax sources are coming from within the hive. We have our wax cappings, which would look like this after you have cleaned and uh, cut your wax off of your comb. Then you'll have your, your cappings and you basically can dry them through a capping spinner or let just let your honey drain in a uh, screen type of uncapping tank. And uh, that's what you'll have as far as, as far as wax cappings goes. Uh, you want to keep your newest cappings that are going to be light like this. You want to try and keep those separate because that's going to give you your lightest wax for your candles or lip balm, uh, anything like that that you're going to use. You want the lightest wax possible to use for, for that kind of stuff. Uh, you can get comb, you know, like this. You can melt that down. It's, it's nice and clean. Uh, old dark comb that's in the hive, you know, that's been there. If you're recycling your combs, you're going to get <coughs> stuff that looks like this. You know, it's going to be really dark and ugly. Uh, you're really not going to make candles out of that unless you want really dark candles. So, you know, this, you know, you can put that aside. You can still use, use it. Uh, people use that for making boot polish, waterproofing, stuff like that. Even some furniture polishes, you know, it doesn't matter that the, that the wax is darker. So there is still a use for that. Uh, hive scrapings or what we call burr comb. You know, you go in and, and uh, you know, you scrape, scrape some wax off of your frames. You can put that in a container, put that aside and melt it down the same way. You know, you can do that. But the cleanest wax is going to be from the comb and the cappings where there was never any brood produced in that comb. That's going to give you your prettiest, finished product of your wax. Uh, you're going to get roughly 10 to 15 pounds of wax for every thousand, every hundred pounds, yeah, every thousand pounds of honey, you're only going to get 10 to 15 pounds of wax. So, you know, I've had, you know, people say, well, I'm going to make beeswax candles, you know, I want to get one or two hives. It's like, well, maybe five years from now you'll have enough of wax to make a handful of candles. You know, it, it takes a lot of it takes a lot of cappings to make a bunch of wax. And they say, well, you know, we're just gonna cut everything out. Well, if you do that, you know, you've destroyed all the work that the bees have may have done making that honeycomb. So it basically takes resources to make the wax. So in order to make one pound of wax, the bees have to produce have to use somewhere between eight and 10 pounds of honey in order to produce that one pound of wax. So there's a lot of resources that goes into wax production in the beehive. So you don't really want to take that comb away from them 
that they're going to reuse. So you want to just use the cappings, basically. And uh, that gives you your, your nicest, nicest finished products. The first step is what we call rendering the wax, where you're going to take this and turn it into this. So you want to get as much honey out as possible. Uh, you're going to take your cappings off, and you're going to drain them somehow. You're going to keep them warm. You don't want to put them in the freezer because the honey is never going to drain out of this. You want, to, you want to do it in a warm room, something like that, and most of the honey will drain out. And uh, they also have commercial, what we call capping wax spinners that basically is just a big centrifuge and it spins the honey out. And uh, you have to remember that if you have wet cappings that still have honey in them, that honey that's left in those cappings is going to attract moisture and that's gonna cause this stuff to ferment if you just leave it set in the bucket. You're going to come back in a month or two and you're going to open that bucket and it's going to be all green and moldy and stinky and you're going to say, oh, shouldn't have done that. So, you know, the other thing, you might open the bucket and, uh, oh, here comes a whole bunch of wax moths because there were some wax moth eggs in there and, uh, and they went to town on, on your cappings because your cappings are still going to have some debris in there that the wax moths are going to go after. And so that's the other thing that you have to watch. Uh, some some methods say that you want to wash and dry the cappings completely. Uh, the water wet cappings are going to mold. Again, there's different, different methods. You know, everybody will tell you a different way you know, to render your wax. The wax that I use never touches water. It's done either in a solar wax melter or in a double boiler, which I'll show you later on. Again, when you, when you wash the wax, you know, when you, when you take this and put it in a bucket of water or whatnot, yes, this is going to float. You're going to put it in with some warm water. The wax is going to float. Your honey is going to get in the water. And if you do not process it right away, that water in these moist cappings is really going to make it ferment really fast. Uh, solar wax melter, that is an excellent way to do it, especially on the amateur side, the hobbyist side, so to speak, you don't have a whole, whole lot of wax. Even with, you know, 20 or 30 hives, you're not going to have that much. You're going to have a few bucketfuls of wax that you're going to be able to process. So you're going you're to do that in a relatively amount of time, as long as the sun shines. Uh, there's wax presses that uh, old-fashioned, I've not seen any newer ones, but they're basically just like an apple cider press. You put your wax cappings in there and crank this thing down and it squishes the honey out and you get drier wax cappings. A water bath, you know, again, you can put the, the wax in, uh, in bags like you would use for canning or something like that. Uh, you put the wax in the bags, tie the bags up and dunk them in a, in a uh, pan of water, in a pot of water. And the, what we call slum gum, the debris that is left over that is entrained with this wax as you uncapped it, that stuff stays in the bag and the wax then floats to the top. Uh, you have to watch because you will get what's called spongy wax depending on how soft your water is. A lot of times, you know, you may make candles out of that wax and as those candles burn, they go you know, because there's a little bit of water molecules that have gotten trapped in, in those wax. And, uh, you know, and then there's the capping melters, which they're usually a, a big tray that has some infrared tubes on it that heats that up and it melts and runs out. There's different ones available. You know, you can use a double boiler, which you'll see in mine later. Go to the uh, flea market and pick up a couple of canning pots, a big one and a little one, stick them inside each other, the wax goes in the, in the one that doesn't touch the water, you boil the water boils and wax melts and it works really good. Uh, to filter the wax, the wax needs to be somewhere in the vicinity of 180 degrees <coughs> and uh, you can, the easy way, easiest way to do that is to uh, go to Harbor Freight or some 
discount store. A lot of times they put them on sale. They're a little infrared thermometer. It looks like a little pistol grip thing. And uh, it shoots a uh, infrared temperature down at the wax. It's real easy to check your, check your temperature that way. You can have a fancy wax processing tank that you have, have purchased. There's a, a solar melter and one of the uh, other type of melters that Kelly's was the one that had these type of uh, melter. You just put the wax in and uh, there's a water jacket around that and it uh, melts the wax, puts it down in a bucket. Now you still have all the other junk in the wax so you're still gonna have to clean it some other way. And in a lot of cases you can take that wax once it's been melted and a lot of the junk has floated out of it, you can take that chunk and put it in a solar melter. Uh, wax in a solar melter sometimes will turn out a couple shades lighter than any other way you've, you've done it because the sun actually helps bleach out some of the impurities that are in there so you'll get lighter wax if you do it in a solar melter. Pardon? Uh, in a solar melter, the, uh, the slum gum, so to speak, we'll call it the, the residue that's left behind. You know, we'll take this one for example. You put your, your wax in here, and you have a screen here, uh, and the slum gum, if you're using anything that came out of, out of a hive, your pupil casings and stuff like that, all of that stuff stays behind up here and the cleaner wax runs down through there in, into a tray. Uh, the one I have uh, has basically a heavy screen here and then a finer screen that it has to go through to get down. And so that takes a whole lot of the, a whole lot of the stuff out. And then even, even after that, you still have some stuff left in there. So when you put it in a double boiler, you let it sit there and heat for a while. The good wax is all gonna come to the top and after an hour or so, there's still gonna be, you're gonna be surprised, you thought that this was clean, and you're gonna be surprised at the layer of gunk that you have on the bottom. Not a whole lot, but there'll be, there be a, a layer down there if, you, if you're doing a, you know, five or 10 pounds of wax, you're gonna have a good quarter inch of, of gunk still on the bottom of that pot, even on which you thought was clean. So it, it varies you know, on, the, on the wax. The, uh, like I said, solar melter works good. Again, you have to have some nice sunshine. Different types, of, different types of solar melters. You can make them any size, what, about twice the length of this table here. He's a semi-commercial guy. He has a lot, of, a lot of beeswax, so he had built this gigantic solar melter, and that's where he does all of his wax. This one is up off the ground a little bit, makes it easier not to have to bend down when you're putting stuff in and out of, in and out of the solar melter. Various homemade designs, you know, anything from uh, a nice, nice box that you've made it out of to uh, a cooler, something like that. You know, there's, there's all kind of plans on the internet for solar melters. They're all over the place, a low cost one, uh, you have a uh, insulated box, like you may get some candy in or uh, some medical supplies. You get a little styrofoam box. You can use a little small styrofoam cooler, uh, plastic tub inside, a little paper towel, something to hold it in there and throw your blobs of wax in there and uh, it works just fine. You know, a little piece of glass or plexiglass on top and uh, you know, you have a very low cost wax melter for just a little bit of wax if you have it. You move up, like I said, this is, this is a uh, Kelly's melter where you just dump the wax in. There's a uh, heater in here. There's a water jacket down here on the bottom. The, uh, the wax isn't touching any water. It's, it's underneath and the uh, wax flows out of there. Again, it's, at this point in time, it's really not the nicest, cleanest wax, but it's all melted and you can put it in some size that is usable for you. It's basically, you know, they're saying it's raw wax. You know, you just have, a, have it in a bucket or you can, it comes out of here and into a pan or something like that. Uh, this already has a 
part of a double boiler arrangement here already, it looks like they're dumping it in there and then they can refine it a little bit further after that. The, uh, the big time commercial guys have these huge things that, again, like I said, they have an infrared heater which will melt anything in there and again, you get raw wax. If they're using just cappings, then the wax comes out pretty nice. And that's what comes out of their, their machines, you know, just a whole, whole batch of wax. Uh, it can be messy. You know, if uh, you're doing this in your kitchen and uh, something slips, the wax kind of goes over your cabinets, uh, on the floor, uh, anytime you're doing stuff in the kitchen, you know, there's going to be wax that you're not going to see went somewhere. And you walk around in the kitchen a little bit and it's like, oh, there's this dirty spot here. Oh, yeah, that's wax that got some dirt on it that you've been walking on for a couple of days. Uh, you get it on your kitchen cabinets. Uh, something overflows when you're making a mold, when you're filling a mold. It overflows and goes down the side of the cabinet. And it's like, well, you wait till it cools and you can take it off of there very carefully. And then you can polish your cabinet up. It has a nice wax coating on it. You know, it, it shines really pretty. But that's, that's the kind of things, you know, you have to think about. Uh, the other thing, you know, Dave Howellman from up in Wooster, you know, he does it on the, on the floor, which, yeah, that, he was a couple years younger when, he, when that picture was taken. Uh, you know, he's filling up all these little containers, uh, which you can then press out and you have have your wax to refine later on or to take it to the market and sell. But again, you know, you're going to have a mess on the floor because sooner or later something is going to upset, overflow, and you're going to have wax everywhere. Hey, well, I, I kind of do my like that. I, I spread out these uh, spilter's paper. It comes about a three-foot roll. Okay. Put out a couple, three pieces of that just so just they're going out and get through just like you get it at, at uh, scraps from like a newspaper or no, something? No, no, they Lowe's, Home Depot sells it oh, okay. in, in rolls. Oh, okay, just like a, just, just like, paper. just brown, yeah. like wrapping paper, or whatever. Yeah, it's heavier, yeah. Yeah, that's, yep. Oh, yeah, there's no doubt about it. You know, no matter how careful you think you're going to be, it, you're going to have wax somewhere that you don't want it. <laughs> Uh, filter media to, to strain it. Uh, again, you have to have, you know, right temperature. You can use paper towels. The blue shop towels work very well. Uh, I've used those a lot. Use sweatshirt material. You know, go to some, some recycle, recycle place and get uh, old sweatshirts or whatever. Uh, you can... Yeah, the funny, fuzzy side up, right. Uh, you can go to uh, somebody that uh, has uh, deep fryers. You can get filters like this, and they have a little container, a little screen thing that they set in. You can use something like this. Uh, the wax has to be really hot for this. You know, it's got to be, it's got to be pushing the 200 degrees to have it flow through, through one of these. Cheesecloth works okay. Nylon filters, cloth filters, sweatshirts. Uh, the shop towels work good uh, when you're going to process your wax to make candles or something like that. You want it to be as pure as possible, as clean as possible. You're going to strain it several times. So you're going to go through you know, a, bunch of, a bunch of straining material as you're doing this. Then once you're done, you know, if you have uh, somebody that's in Boy Scouts that you know or whatever, you kind of fold these things up, scrunch them up. They make excellent fire starters for your fireplace, campfire, uh, give them to your Boy Scout troop, anything like that. You know, you have some beeswax there, some cloth material, and make a real good fire starter. Uh, this is pretty much uh, where I do it, out on my patio. Uh, even on the patio, you might want to have one of these little jobbies available, a little fire extinguisher, especially if you're doing this in your kitchen, you better have a fire extinguisher and know how to use it. Uh, you know, it's kind of important, you know, doing it outside, you know, I use my uh, 
smoker arrangement there. I have uh, you know my double boiler, uh, two junky pots. I take it out of there and uh, strain it into. Uh, these work real good. Uh, orange juice containers or something like that. You don't want to use milk because you can never get them clean. But orange juice, apple juice containers like this, they're already a little bit wax coated. And uh, once it solidifies in there, you just peel this off, and uh, you can uh, then take it into your next stage where I'll take that big chunk and uh, these little, I don't know, 10 or $12 pots, they have a little uh, thermostat control on them, which you know you can make it real hot or just to the point where it just stays melted. And depending on what kind of mold you're pouring, whether you're pouring a thin candle or a big fat mold, you need to adjust your temperature on this a little bit. And it's something that you just have to do trial and error with your molds so that you don't get too much, you don't want too much shrinkage. And on the bigger molds, you won't get too much if you, if you have your temperature right. And on, uh, on the tall taper candles, you know, it may shrink, you know, a quarter inch to a half an inch, and you just have to kind of keep up with it. And with this, you know, you have a nice little pour tip that you can pour it in there and it works really good from, uh, from that standpoint. So basically, you're straining it out of here into some good old red Solo cups. And uh, once they're in, in these, you can peel that off of there, and it works you know, really nice to put those in your pot. The pot? Uh, Walmart, drugstore, I've, you know, I've seen them just about anywhere. Uh, these ones, you know, they actually they have a lid on them to start with. It's just like a, a teapot, basically. They have a lid on them. You just pop the lid off and, and it gives you a, a nice nice area and it, it works really good like I said I, I usually will put the finished product in these and then when we go to make candles you just have to put a couple of these in there and uh, you're good to go but for uh, for a final final strain when we're doing the candles you probably strain it two to four times and if you're going to enter it into any into any kind of competition, uh, a honey and wax show, something like that, you're going to want to strain it probably five or six times to make sure that you have nice, clear, clean wax. And uh, that's, you know, that's what you end up with there. And like I say, you can end up with some really, really nice candles from, uh, from the uh, candle molds. <coughs> and that's pretty, that's pretty much how uh, how that aspect of the process goes. Uh, you have the desired color of wax, of course, is like this. You want a nice canary yellow, they call it, as far as the wax goes. People really don't want to see candles that look that color. You know, so you, you really need to, to have some, some nice wax to make your products out of. Wax can be different, different grades, <coughs> depending on, you know, again, these are chunks, chunks of wax made by the commercial guys. You know, the, the dark stuff is, is what you'll get when they're processing just honeycomb, old honeycombs and stuff like that. You're going to get much darker wax. And uh, again, it's going to look like this, this real dark piece up here. Sometimes they'll mix it, you know, when they sell it to... Kelly's or something like that, and they'll just take it and sell whatever. So that's like a lot of times when you buy foundation for your beehives, you're gonna have, your wax is gonna be darker, lighter, it's gonna smell one way, another, one time, and you know, the darker wax usually has a different odor to it. So now, we've gone through all of that, you know, so what do we do with the wax? Again, depending on the color that you have, whether it's this or this, you can do different things different things with it. You know, you're going to make candles. Uh, you're going to have little Christmas tree ornaments that you can make, you know, these little little ornaments that you can make five or six of these in a, in a mold sometimes, depending on where you've bought the molds. Uh, small candles, big candles, uh, little blocks of wax. These are real good. There's a lot of people, oh, you have beeswax? You know, guys use it for their, uh, for their uh, strings on their bow. Uh, Woodworkers use it 
a lot of times to put on nails and screws. It keeps the wood from splitting as they're, as they're putting it in. Good to use on your drawer slides and, and stuff like that in your uh, kitchen. Yeah, <coughs> like you said, it makes the screws go in easier also. Uh, lip balm, ham creams, stuff like that. You want, you want nice, clean wax. You know, if you're going to put it in a, in a lip balm or a hand cream, you know, you don't want black stuff floating around in there. So you want to make it as clean as you can, uh, as pure as you can. You know, we, we promote our honey and our products as being pure. So we want to make it look that way to the public. Polishes, again, you know, some furniture polishes, you know, they can be darker. You know, you really don't see that color when, when you smear it on. You're mixing this with some oils or something like that. And uh, guys, I have a, a lot of people use that for, for boot polish. Uh, guys call and, and buy it. They, uh, they do muzzle loading and uh, the uh, reenact, Civil War reenactments and stuff like that. They'll, they'll even want this. They want this to make their candles out of because they say that looks more original to what, you know, what they had. It looks, it looks more authentic. You know, so that's, you know, there's a market for, for all of the wax. You know, again, you don't want big chunks of something left in this. You're still going to strain it. You know, you're not going to strain it six times, but you're going to strain it at least once to get it so that it doesn't have any chunks of anything floating around in it. Uh, again, like I said before, fire starters with the used filter stuff that you're, that you're done with. When a beeswax candle burns, it usually produces a nice white round flame. Uh, it smokes the least out of any of the types of candles that there are available out there. You know, people say, well, gee, you know, this, this burns really nice. Uh, burns two times longer than paraffin. Uh, again, what I said before about if it's processed in a, in a water bath, there there's some water molecules that get entrained in with those wax molecules. Even though we say that the wax is lighter, these waxes less dense than the water, there's always some little bit of water molecules that get trapped in there somehow. You know, and I've had people argue that point till the cows come home and it's like, you know, I've seen it and you can, you can tell it even if you have just a little bit of moisture that got in that wax when you're heating it up in one of these pots, this pot will, it sounds like it's boiling and you look in there and there's bubbles coming off of the bottom because the wax has floated to the top and the little bit of water molecules that were in there, they're on the bottom of that hot surface and they're, and they're boiling down at the bottom. So the, the wax actually will sizzle in this pot. And a lot of times it's like, well, okay, I'm just gonna let it sit there and sizzle and let the water get, basically get evaporated out of there you know, before we use it. So that's one of the little, one of the little tricks uh, and, you know, if you play with it long enough, you know, you can get a nice award that was a couple years ago, that was the uh, EAS award that, uh, that we got for beeswax, the best of show at, uh, at EAS. Uh, that's just part of our one little back section of our booth here a couple years ago. Um, we have various assorted candles. Instead of, you know, I'm sure you've been to different fairs and festivals and stuff like that where people are selling beeswax and they have everything setting out on the table. Well, when you're at a fair outside or a festival, sometimes even inside, you know, there's dirt floating around. You know, everybody walks by and picks it up. Well, you have 10 people pick something up and by the time the person comes that wants to buy that, it looks kind of cruddy. So, Susie decided, it's like, well, hey, you know, we're going to do this. We're going to put them in little fancy gift bags. And, you know, people just love it that way. And we have one set of candles, basically one of everything, is setting out on a table for a display. You can pick it up, touch it, feel it, smell it, do whatever you want with it. But when you go to buy it, it's going to be a nice clean one in a nice bag. So that's, that's kind, of, kind of the way we do it. And, uh, you know, they wanted me to give you guys a little overview of of beeswax and we kind of did this basically from start to finish what the bees do with it and what we do with it in the end. So we have five minutes or so for questions if 
Anybody has any, any questions, want to see any of this stuff? Come on up. Just a comment. Uh, a way that I, get, I think it cuts out maybe a filter or two. It's kind of did a similar thing. We just pick up uh, at like Goodwill, different places, crock pots, uh -huh. you know, old crock pot pots. Yeah. And so put, once it's maybe that, that place, the big, no, the big, oh, okay. one, yeah. get it, you know, get it there. And melt that and then take like a soup label mm -hmm. and dip off the top so you're leaving all that right. grit and stuff in the bottom. Right. And dip that off and pour it through your, uh, yeah. Which is basically what, yeah. you know, you're, what I'm you're, doing there you're not, only. You stop before you get down into the junk right. in the bottom. Right. And then when you get cleaner, just do that again. Yeah. And the takeout, so that's all I'm going to say about that. But the takeout cups, like you get Chinese in, uh -huh. like soup or something, those yeah. are kind of heavy. Yeah. That's like the best too. thing I've found for mold because when that sits up, it's heavy enough, you can just turn it over on that paper I was talking about and right. tap it and it'll slide it. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I've used some of those, the, the, the taller ones, like you get in a deli and stuff like that, I've used, I've used them. Uh, these are nice because uh, once, you, uh, once you have the, the wax in there, you know, fill it up pretty close to the top, and then you can basically just take this and, and it, it breaks and you can just tear it right off. You know, it works out good that way, and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's like one of those things I'm showing you how I do it, and everybody can come up with their own idea, their own container. You know, you may have somebody that you know that works somewhere that makes these and has seconds, you know, and you can get a whole stack of these. Uh, you know, to, the, I use these, you know, we get orange juice or apple juice, and you put it in there, and you can just put these in a box and, and store them that way. And when you need wax, it's like, well, okay, we need to make some finished wax. So we just take one of these, pull it apart, pop it in the pot. And uh, a little while later, you have wax ready to, to finish strain and, and make whatever you need to make. Yes? You said that it was, you get 10 to 15 pounds of wax for every thousand, thousand pounds of honey. Right now, uh, as far as as far as honey production, probably about 30 hives, something like that. And uh, before we started making candles, you know, we I saved wax for a good many years before we actually started. And then a lot of times you may have somebody, a friend of yours that is a beekeeper, and they cut off their cappings and they have no idea what to do with them and say, hey, you know, I'll take, because a lot of times they just pitch them in the garbage, you know, so, you know, hey, you know, give them to me, you know, it's like, and some people, you know, I've had, I've had some people that have even melted it down and, uh, you know, they come up with a, uh, with a box full, you know, and say, hey, you want this? You know, <laughs> definitely, you know, I'll give you a couple jars of honey or, or you know, whatever. So it, it works out really good, you know, and, uh, Friends, you know, you may be at a bee club meeting and, and say, well, hey, you know, this is, this is what, you know, we do. And it's like, oh, yeah, I got, I got a couple buckets of that sitting in, my, sitting in my basement. As long as they haven't put water in it, you know, or rinsed it out with water, it's most likely good. You know, I've had, I've had wax that just came out of, out of the hives uh, like this, basically, that sets in a bucket. And as long as you have the bucket sealed, so that wax moths aren't going to get in there. You know, most of the time what gets in this is not the big wax moth, it's just the little, the little teeny moths that are like in your uh, oatmeal and stuff like that, the little meal, mealworm moths that, that'll get into that. And, uh, but as long as it's sealed, you know, you're good to go. Anything else? And then take it out and scrape off that layer that's on yes, the bottom. Yes, you can do have that. You, have you tried that? Does it make it have to do it filter it less times? Or? Uh, yes, it's it's already most of the gunk has settled to the bottom. So when you when you can do that, and you'll have some of the gunk on the bottom, there will still be a little bit of honey left in there. So it'll be gooey, and some of it will be hard and look look like this. You can scrape it off, you know, you can take a, a sharp chisel and chisel it off until you get into the good wax, 
and so you're going to have wax that is going to be pretty clean. You know, again, you might still want to strain it another time through, you know, through some, some other strainer material just to get it a little bit cleaner. Like that double board, the, uh -huh. one, the one that you have your wax in? Yeah. Will you, like, go down so far and then you'll take that and clean it off a little bit and then save it and start over? Yeah, I'll, dump, I'll usually dump that into, dump that into some container and, and let it cool and do that. I'll scrape the biggest part of the gunk off of the bottom and then that next chunk will go in in the next batch that I do. Yeah.